been action over the last you know, few years on gangs. In fact, it's an ongoing operation by police and by justice and by others. But we have to recognise that gang membership has been growing. Uh, they've cornered a certain market, which is around illegal drugs, and they're making a lot of money off that. Mm. Uh, and we've seen an importation of a different style of gang activity in the last you know, four or five years, particularly as a result of the 501 deportations from Australia. Can, can you pin it back to them, though? Because as of May, 108 of the 7,700 on the na national gang list are 501s, only 108. Yeah, but it's triggered uh, a series of activities here in New Zealand, including the, the competition between gangs. Um, it's meant that some of the existing gangs have, have upped their level of activity in, in response to, to new uh, gangs coming in onto their patch. Can we so, really pin it back to them? Because, I mean, 35% of the prison population are gang-affiliated. It's it, been an ongoing problem. I, I would never make the claim that it, that it is the only thing that's contributed. It is a contributing factor. There are others as well. You know, the, the disengagement of a section of our, our youth population has also been a contributing factor. Mm. You know, we've seen the number of kids disengaging, um, not just from education, but from society generally. That has been increasing, and they, uh, unfortunately, um, sometimes find that they they find a level of engagement, they find a place in a gang that they haven't been able to find elsewhere. Just in terms of why you're acting now, I mean, other political parties have been quicker to roll out gang policies. It looks like you're lagging behind. Is it not just a political reaction to these allegations that you're soft on crime? Well, it's easy to roll out big fanfare policies that don't actually work and don't actually make a difference. So take car crushing, for example. It was a, it was a big ticket item, a lot of hoopla about it. You do and like to bring many, that example and, out. But, but, but because, because very few cars actually got crushed. Um, so it was, it was a song and a dance that really didn't make a difference in terms of the level of offending. So we want to make sure that what we're doing is actually hitting the right spot. Okay, so, so that's what these proposals are about. That you just but, but, you know, there's an ongoing operation of uh, uh, operations um, by police around gang activity right now. Mm. So you will have seen in the last uh, week or so a lot of work by police that's resulted in arrests, it's resulted in firearms, cash, drugs being seized from gangs. There's a lot of work goes on for months before that often. That's police action. That's not government policy, though. So let's look at the proposals that you've brought out. Um, you're talking about a new offence of intimidation by firing a gun, maximum five years in prison. That's to target drive-by shootings, is it? Absolutely. Uh, in other instances where you know gangs are using firearms in public places in order to intimidate, mm. um, there are other offences that police can use. They don't have the degree of penalty associated with them that the new offence that we're introducing right, does. Right, so have you're upping, upping, the, upping the, the penalty. Absolutely. Yeah, but if someone's trespassing on my property, it's not gang-related, and I fire a warning shot to intimidate them off my property... Does the same apply to me? F firing, uh, uh, you know, discharging a firearm in order to intimidate will become an offence mm. uh, in, in a greater range of places, including um, the example that you've just mentioned, including if a farmer fires a shotgun to ward off stock rustlers, yes. Yeah. But, of course, that doesn't mean they're going to be prosecuted. So, but shouldn't they be prosecuted? It's the same offence. Well, ultimately, you know, police always have a, a degree of discretion as to when they prosecute. Can we rely on the police discretion? I mean, they're undergoing a sort of programme right now about bias and predecessors in your seat have admitted that there's unconscious bias in the police. And that is a different challenge, but it is a, it is a, it is a you know, real challenge. It's one that I know the police are working very, very hard on. Yeah, but there could be, be bias in the application of this new law. Well, if, I think if we you know, took that to its you know, fullest extent, we wouldn't have a police force at all. Um, we've actually, you know, we, the government sets the law, the police have to enforce that law, and of course they should always be looking to make sure they're doing that in a very fair and equitable way. You're also targeting cash profits. Uh, this will mean watches, boats, precious metals, jewellery cannot be sold for cash. Is that that's for everybody? That's not just for gangs. That's right. But there yeah. aren't that many law-abiding people who are showing on, showing up to a car dealer and offering a you know twenty thousand dollar suitcase of cash in order to buy a new car. Uh, what level does this kick in? What is what is the the value level? Uh, the the we... value we determine by the legislation which is being drafted at the moment. The working number at the moment because it aligns with the anti-money laundering legislation that's already in place is ten thousand mm. dollars. But we'll you know we'll have an opportunity through the legislative process to test that. So if I want to sell my car and somebody turns up with ten thousand $1,001. How are you going to police that? Well, that would be a private sale. So what we're talking about here is high-value dealers. So we're talking right. about car dealers. We're talking about people who trade in jewellery rather than uh, people who are, uh, you know, making so a one-off one one sale on Trade Me. Right. Uh, that, that's not the group that are being targeted here. These are people who are dealers. Um, that's where we're targeting because we know that's where the money laundering can take place. So I can't pay cash for a car at a dealer? Not at a dealer. It's over 10000 That's right. How are you going to police that? 
Is uh, it up to the dealer to say where'd you get your money from? There's already anti-money laundering legislation in place. This is expanding the range of places where that applies. Um, and you know, So there's already quite a lot of work that's been done on that over quite a period of time. Does a car dealer really want to, going to have to go to that level of compliance? Well, I, I don't think you'll find that there are many car dealers that would be selling cars for cash um, to law-abiding citizens uh, where they're worth over $10,000. You know, frankly, people don't walk around with that kind of cash these days. Mm. Um, you know, we live in an electronic uh, age where people are transferring money electronically, uh, and from a law enforcement perspective, that's a much better thing. All right, there's also new search powers, which mean police can go back again and again to the same address for 14 days, and they won't have to get a new warrant each time they do that. What checks and balances are going to be in place to make sure that those kind of repeated searches are legitimate? So that is a limited power. It's still a warranted power, so they will still need to go and convince a judicial officer that it's warranted um, in, in order to get a warrant. Yeah. Um, and it will be in a limited range of circumstances. So it would be where there's gang tension that is that is, is imminently going to lead to or could imminently lead to armed conflict, conflict, for example. So they would have to go and demonstrate, look, there's a, there's a, there's a fight going on between gangs, there's firearms uh, involved, and in those circumstances, they would be able to get a warrant that would give them that power for up to 14 days. And of course, it, it doesn't have to be for 14 days. It could be for a shorter period, depending on the case that they make. So there's no concern that other premises that gangs have like stored stuff at, like their Harleys or their cash or their drugs, and they're going to be searched, and it's been someone else who's not involved with the gang, but they've been told to use it. It could be quite terrifying for a child to have repeated police searches. There will be a clear definition around who a gang member is. So if you're a patched gang member, you know, a, a, a gang prospect, etc. What we have to do in the legislative drafting process uh, and then in the legislative process as it works through Parliament is make sure that we're drawing the right boundary around that so that we're not targeting the people who aren't intended to be targeted. Having said that, if you're offering storage to a, a gang and gangs are coming and going from your premises in order to store their ill-gotten gains, then you should be subject to that. How can you guarantee that these proposals will only be used for gangs, all of them? Well, the key issue here is around the warranted, uh, you know, in terms of the warranted search power, that is specifically applied to gangs. Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously they'll have to go and convince a judicial officer uh, that the warrant is, you know, is justified in those circumstances. And in terms of the so, other proposals so there is a, as well. there is a protection I mean, there. There's protection but, but there, some, but for but, the other ones? But some of those other ones will apply to other circumstances as well. So, for example, the expansion of the range of offences in which police can impound a vehicle for 28 days will be expanded to, to a wider range range of offences and that won't just apply to gangs. Um, it may also apply, it may also be used uh, in the case of boy races for example, um, because they are also causing a, a lot of public harm in some of their activities. So my message is if you don't want your vehicle impounded, don't, don't do those illegal activities with it. All of this is really bottom of the cliff stuff. You've talked about recruitment before, but how are you going to stop recruitment to gangs. We've got a whole program of work and we will have more to say about this in, in the coming weeks around youth engagement. So we've already announced a plan to get kids back to school and we've got a lot of work happening in that space and the police are actually um, you know, partnering with schools and with communities mm. to get kids back to school um, and that's, that's already starting to, to make a difference. Because but, just on that, I mean the attendance at school in secondary particularly, only 54% of secondary students regularly attend and that's your education portfolio there. I mean, that's a shocking statistic, isn't it? Yeah, so I mean, I think we should be a little sophisticated in how we look at those numbers. So those numbers are based on a 90% rate of attendance, and typically the historical uh, um, uh, you know, trend for, for that, the, the historical number series we look at, is term two attendance. Now there's 10 weeks in term two, uh, often Easter, uh, Queen's birthday weekend will apply there as well. If a family takes their child on an overseas holiday during term two for one week, and then they have a long weekend, that, that, so i.e. the kids away from school for more than six days, then they will be counted in those statistics. Those are not the group of kids that we should be as worried about. Now I, I would yeah. say to parents, don't was... take your kids on holiday during term time, it's not a good thing to do, but I'm not going to lie awake in bed at night worrying about it. What I will worry about though, is the fact that the number of kids who are chronically absent, mm. um, has increased from about 4% to about 7.5%. Now that is a really concerning number, because those are the kids who we should be worried about. Those are the kids who are out and about on the streets, who 
aren't regularly attending school yep. uh, and they are getting into trouble. That's the group we've got to fight to target. So you talk about youth engagement and youth activities, I believe, in your press conference. What do you mean by youth engagement and youth activities to target those kids that are not going to school and are susceptible to gang recruitment? Well, we've seen some good programs. We funded through the COVID-19 Relief Fund, uh, the Ministry of Youth Development, to have a thing called the Arkonga Fund, where they funded a number of community-based initiatives that were about getting young people constructively engaged in things. Now, we're, we're having a good look at that and saying, well, what's working? Can we, can we, can we do more in that area? Because the Police Association says that actually prevention starts with keeping kids in school. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. But sometimes a, a, a little bit extra outside of school, whether it's more club sport, or, that can actually make a difference in making sure kids feel part of a community. And then they will be more inclined to be at school. What about the victims of youth crime? Like your previous Minister Porter Williams announced $6 million to help prevent retail crime. But what's happening to that? Because we're smashing grabs are ongoing. There's a, about a thousand businesses have had fog cannons installed. Um, there are quite a few businesses, up to 500 where we'll be working with them to, if you like, harden their premises to make it more difficult for that type of activity to take place. Is that all part of the $6 million? In, in, uh, the fog cannons is, a, is, a, is an addition to the $6 million. But the police have been actively following up those recidivist offenders. So mm. I think over 30 young people covering uh, about 200 different, you know, series uh, offences uh, have been arrested and are going through the judicial system as a result of that. It's, it's never going to be possible for police to prevent every uh, youth offence where mm. you've got some kids who are getting into trouble. Police can't be on every street corner to detect that ahead of it. But they are sending a very clear signal with the way they're following up that they will follow up and there will be consequences. You've said that success in this role in terms of gangs will be a reduction in offending. Have you got a target of how much you want that to be reduced by and which particular offences? No, I haven't because actually, you know, what we're doing through the police is disrupting the gang activity. But you have to look at the broad range of measures. You know, is drug consumption going down? That would be a good thing. Are there fewer people joining gangs? Yes, that would be a good thing. Are there fewer young people falling onto that pathway that leads them to more serious criminal offending? That would be a good thing. So there's a range of measures. I'm not going to pick one out and say that's more important than all the others. I just want to move on to masks in schools. And so the government's providing 30,000 masks a week, uh, but it's not requiring the kids to wear them. So is that a half measure? One of the things that I have heard from school leaders is that they want to be trusted to make the right decisions for their schools. So we have not said mm. that they can't have a, a mask mandate in, a, in an individual school, but we've said it's up to the school to determine what they want for their school community. If they want to require masks, they can absolutely require masks. But you've got the Director General of Health Actually, Boonville is saying that masking reduces the risk of being infected by half. It sounds like a no-brainer, really. But it's one of the things that schools have to work through. They have to work through the practicalities of that. They make decisions about where masks are required and where they're not. Well, if not the kids, why not just mandate the teachers? We don't specify when employers have to require their employees to wear a mask. Now, we do in some public settings. Mm. We leave that to the, the employers. This and is the, the public service, the though. The government has mandated other people to wear masks. So, you know, this is the public service. You could force them to wear masks. The, the, the mask requirements in the workplace specified by government are actually quite a narrow range of circumstances and most workplaces are making those decisions for themselves. Is it just that it's not politically acceptable for you to use that word mandate and masks together? No, no not at all. You know, look, I, I've, I've said, you know, I think schools are best positioned to make these decisions and they'll have our full support when they do that. COVID is peaking again, winter illnesses are, are, are peaking, hospitals are under pressure. Is there anything that would change your mind about mask wearing in schools? You never say never. Um, and so, I, you know, I never take anything off the table when it comes to COVID-19, although I'm not lead, you know, primarily responsible for leading that anymore. So just finally, are you relieved that you're no longer the COVID-19 response minister? Oh, I'm, I'm sort of still going through a bit of a decompression process from that, actually. It is a, it is a pretty full-on role, and it is 24-7, and you do live with it all day, every day, and you do spend a lot of time lying awake at night worrying about this thing or the, or the next thing. Um, I still do, actually, to some extent, because I'm still a minister in the government. We are still ultimately responsible for getting New Zealand through a pandemic that's not yet over. Chris Hipkins there. If you've got a news tip, get in touch. We're on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram, or you can email us.